Leader of Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to speak to Bill 12, the Public Health Accountability and Cost Recovery Act. I uh, have been listening intently to the member from Vancouver, Langara, and I think he raises uh, a number of very important and significant issues around this legislation. The intent of the legislation, the idea of government being able to hold accountable companies that cause harm to people, that's a good intent. Um, and as the, the previous member spoke about, we've seen this in the uh, legislation focused and targeted on cigarette companies or on opioid producing companies. Um, but the challenge of this legislation uh, is, is not small. Uh, we have two immediate concerns. Uh, the first one being uh, that this, this legislation seems to uh, be coming in place as a response to, as a reactive response to harms that uh, people in BC, and particularly young people, as was highlighted in the, in the introduction of this legislation, are um, suffering as a result of a variety of uh, forces in their lives, social media, um, vaping uh, companies, for example. But the action in this legislation only comes after those harms have happened. And I think that what I would much prefer to see from government is to look at those harms and how they're happening and where they're happening and then uh, act in a way within the purview of government to be able to reduce and diminish and hopefully uh, make those harms go away. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Secondly, and the member for Vancouver Langara spoke to this, the breadth of the, this proposed legislation, um, the, the questions that this raises given the amount of uncertainty that this legislative uh, package and this regime would create um, and the lack of consultations or the lack of examples of this kind of legislation in other jurisdictions um, the, the former speaker talked about legislative process, and we, we raise this a lot, um, and I, I, I always come up, I try to think of analogies, but I, I, I think legislation should not be a jack-in-the-box, my favorite analogy and worst toy of all time. Um, legislation shouldn't be, surprise, uh, here it is. Uh, it should really be a long, consultative, deliberative process, and I'm... Uh, always eager to learn from our, our chief of staff who comes to us from New Zealand about legislative process in New Zealand and how shocked she was about how rapidly legislation is passed here in BC because there a piece of legislation would be tabled and there would be no intention of passing that bill for at least a year so that there's time to understand it there's time for consultation, there's time for input from stakeholders, there's time for input from the public, there's time for government to make amendments, for opposition parties to make amendments, there's time to get that legislation right before it's passed. And yet the trend we have in BC with our legislation is uh, not only the jack-in-the-box, surprise, <laughs> uh, but also that we don't even go through the basic legislative processes with far too many pieces of legislation that have made their way through this house. Uh, health regulation, forestry, regulation changes, uh, legislation around freedom of information, uh, housing legislation, uh, very significant pieces of legislation often frameworks with lots of regulations to be filled in later um, behind closed doors and orders in council, uh, so that's not public. Uh, but not only are they significant, but we don't 
even have the opportunity to finish the, the process in here that we were all elected to do, which was to be legislators and to be able to ask questions and get ideally very clear and very straightforward answers about the content and the intent of the legislation. And so uh, I think we have a legislative process deficit here in BC and it, it's un unfortunately getting worse. I think, again, ideally it would be good for companies to be held accountable for harm. And uh, again, we've seen this, the, the long, long, long battle to hold cigarettes and companies accountable for the harm that they caused. Um, and, and particularly when it comes to the health, the general health, the public health of the people of BC. As we understand this legislation, it proposes to apply to social media companies which have been shown to produce and use algorithms that have negative health and social impacts on their users, especially on youth. These health impacts have been shown to include addiction, eating disorders, depression, anxiety, a flurry of other detrimental mental illnesses and mental health challenges. We're hopeful, uh, we're hopeful to see government acknowledge and recognize that these harms are happening to young people. But what we would prefer to see would be an investment in the areas of government that are responsible for um, how young people are existing in the world today. So I'll start with schools. Uh, when I was teaching, cell phones were becoming more and more ubiquitous and more and more of a problem in my classrooms. And uh, as a teacher, because there's no, at the time, there were no sort of general rules or expectations around cell phone use, it always had to be a, a form of negotiation and conversation with my students. And generally, at that time, there was a, a willingness on the part of students to say, yeah, I'll put my phone away for the, for the day or I'll put it in my locker until we have break time. Um, because I could see that when the cell phones were out, the, the student's attention was definitely not with me anymore. It was, it was in the phone. Uh, that problem has only deepened and gotten much more entrenched. And we've seen uh, calls from, uh, from politicians and some steps from government recognizing the problem of cell phone use in school but I would argue it hasn't gone nearly far enough. So if we wanted to create the conditions for children to have less harm from social media and from cell phone use, government's realm is really in the education system. And the way in which we could start to uh, take seriously and start to address this is one, uh, you need a blanket, expectation across your education system that personal cell phones don't belong in classrooms. But that's not to say that there isn't technology and tools in classrooms because of course we need young people to learn to use uh, the technology that is so ubiquitous in our lives and, and is becoming more so. But there needs to be an equality built into that. And so rather than some kids come with the brand new MacBook and some kids have the 20 year old laptop that their older siblings or aunt and uncle used, we need schools that provide equal access to the tools that young people need to be learning to use. So one, no personal cell phones in schools. Two, equal access to the devices and the tools that young people need to be learning from. But that that learning is managed in the classroom and the use of those technolo technological tools is focused 
on learning, not on scrolling through social media while your history teacher gives you a lesson on World War II. Although if your history teacher is really entertaining, you will pay attention to that lesson most of the time, but it's pretty hard to compete with TikTok, let me tell you. So in the uh, acknowledgement that we have from government that young people are suffering harms from, uh, from social media and from uh, overuse of these technologies, what I would much prefer to see than a piece of legislation that seems pretty challenging to see if it's going to work or not, and that only applies after harms have happened, I would much rather see a government focused on mitigating and preventing those harms now. So in addition to um, clear and uh, enforceable and equitable policies around the use of technology in classrooms and in schools across BC, we need to see uh, a, a, a pretty significant increase in access to mental health supports in schools, school psychologists. Um, every time I talk to, and I remember this again from teaching, but I know it's gotten much worse, when I talk to school counselors and school psychologists, it is, uh, often they're spread so thinly, sometimes across more than one school, and that the access that the student has, that any student has is very limited. It might be 20 minutes every third week. And we know that kids in crisis, especially in mental health crisis, need access to support and mental health supports immediately. And so creating schools where uh, one, kids aren't crowded into classrooms, they're not in overcrowded classrooms or stacked up in portables. Two, they have uh, teachers and education assistants who are uh, themselves not overwhelmed and overwrought and doing more than they should and having too many, uh, too many students and, and not enough resources. And then three, having built into our schools, which is the best place to reach kids with mental health supports, really accessible school psychologists, counselors, and many avenues to health and wellness. The other part about our schools is that, uh, and I was just reading uh, a caption about a book that's been written by social psychologist Jonathan Haidt called The Anxious Generation. And he says, the mass migration of childhood into the virtual world has disrupted the social and neurological development of children. So it's not just that the kids aren't paying attention to their very interesting history lesson in class, it's that they are spending so much time in this virtual world that the developmental stages that we go through as humans, small humans and then uh, older humans, really do rely on uh, play and social interaction and being outdoors and jumping around and all the sorts of things that probably most of us remember from our childhood and maybe dreaded sometimes but recognize now that it was fun to run around and um, take risks. And so we need to take the evidence that we have on neurological development, on social development. We need to take the, the guidance that we're getting from more and more experts on child psychology and child mental health who are all saying the same thing, that our kids' mental health is harmed by too much time in the virtual world too much time on cell phones, too much time on social media. And uh, what a government can do, has the capacity and the resources to do, is actually to ensure that we're creating the conditions in schools where kids are spending eight hours of their day, five days of the week, or lucky kids on Salt Spring, four days of the week. Uh, we're creating those conditions 
where we are ensuring that kids are getting the experiences and the um, access to the, the non-virtual world that, that they need to have to be well. Having a piece of legislation that says, someday in the future, at some point, the government might bring a lawsuit against the companies that at some point in the past caused harm to children is not the proactive response that we need to take in what is another one of these unfolding slow motion emergencies that we have in our society. I um I I really I really think that um, where we falter is when we ignore preventative measures, when we ignore what we can, the, the conditions that we can create to make people have the opportunity to be well. Uh, public health is such a great example of this. Public health is meant to, to keep people healthy uh, through all manner of methods, education, access to healthy food, uh, immunization programs, uh, you know, the, the access to programs for little kids, medium-sized kids, big-sized kids, all of these are a form of public health. Mental health care for a lot of families, because the kids can't access it in school, there is often a price barrier, a cost barrier, uh, that is insurmountable for a lot of families. And even if they can address the cost barrier of accessing a psychologist for their child, the, the time that it takes to get an appointment is often way beyond what is necessary in, to address the crisis that a child might be in. I also want to just talk about an elephant in the room when it comes to talking about companies that are causing harm, that are causing a risk of disease, injury, or illness. Uh, the elephant in the room for public health impacts uh, is certainly hard to ignore when we look ahead to the summer that we are surely going to have another smoke-filled summer that is going to cause uh, incredible public health impacts, impacts to our lung health, our brain health, uh, impacts to our mental health. And year over year, we're seeing the impacts of the fossil fuel industry and its continued burning of fossil fuel and mining of fuels uh, to be burned. Um, there are enormous public health impacts from the fossil fuel industry. It's fossil fuel pollution is directly linked to 34,000 premature deaths in Canada each year. 34,000 people die earlier than they should because of fossil fuel pollution, and over 8 million people globally. I would argue that there isn't a greater, an industry creating greater harm when it comes to public health right now in the world. The Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment pushed for a fossil fuel ad ban for two years and worked with NDP Member of Parliament, Charlie Angus, to shape Bill C-372 to address fossil fuel advertising. Again, here's something that governments can do proactively. Angus's private member's bill is modeled after strategies aimed at preventing the tobacco industry from promoting cigarettes, since we know smoking is harmful to human health. 
Smoking when it's the air we breathe, also very harmful to human health. And this kind of bill is one way to deal with false ads, as we had from the, smoke, the cigarette industry for a long time, doctors you know, say that this is the best cigarette to smoke. It's a way to deal with false advertising that threatens climate progress by warping the understanding of potential solutions at a time when people need to be making decisions around whether to support fossil gas development projects or whether to use more fossil fuels. There's an environmental group in BC that is uh, suing the BC natural gas utility Fortis BC, accusing it of greenwashing its product through marketing that makes the company seem more environmentally friendly than it is. And the Federal Competition Bureau is investigating after Greenpeace accused Canada's six biggest oil sands producers of false advertising for a similar marketing campaign that suggested the fossil fuel sector was reducing greenhouse gas emissions and helping Canada achieve its climate targets. I think it's time for us in BC to take this public health issue far more seriously. I'm sure all of you have seen and some members of this house are actually featured in the BC LNG will reduce global emissions ad campaign that is ubiquitous on social media, on buses, on billboards, airports. And uh, it's a campaign that they, they seem to, I, I'll take it, uh, imitation is the greatest form of flattery, but they certainly seem to like uh, what BC Green ads look like because they have copied them almost exactly. Um, but this is an example of where government could be taking proactive steps to try to prevent harm, as opposed to waiting for harm to happen, waiting for health impacts to happen, and then saying, well, we will find a way to sue these companies for the harm they've caused at some point down the road, and then we will recoup the cost to our healthcare system from the health, uh, health harm that they've caused for the people who are ill or injured or for the people who have lost loved ones because of these health harms, I think that's cold comfort. I think almost everybody would agree we would all much prefer to see the harms prevented rather than to see government tell us don't worry, at some point in the future, we can, uh, we can sue and recoup financial losses from these companies. I think uh, the member for Vancouver Langara also talked about this at length, but, and I, I started here, but concerns about the consultation process, about the implementation of this bill. From what I understand, this legislation is broad and proof of harm requirement is quite low. For businesses, as we know, that rely on certainty, the breadth of this legislation and the speed with which government appears to intend to pass it can create real uncertainty and therefore real economic risk for BC. Some of the proposals in this legislation haven't been tried anywhere, for example, making Facebook liable for what individuals have done with the platform, something that has been discussed for years in international forums without any resolution. Linking the harm to a specific platform as opposed to an individual who posts on that platform also appears to be unprecedented. The lack of consultation and engagement, again, worries me. It appears that there was very little consultation done before this legislation was tabled. Um, and like the terrible jack-in-the-box, people were surprised to see this legislation arrive and are expressing, uh, groups are expressing their very real concerns with this. So I would end by saying 
what I would much rather see from government is an investment in the health and well-being of people, especially youth, right now. There's so many tools available to government to actually create significantly, substantially healthier places for our kids to spend their days. And I think about this a lot, that uh, kind of message a child internalizes when they go to a school that doesn't have enough resources, that uh, doesn't have enough education assistance, where the teachers are burning out, and so they might be having a, a series of uh, teachers on call come in. The kind of message does a child internalize about how they're valued in our province and in our society when what they see around them every day when they go to school is not enough. It's not enough of anything to go around. And I think if we wanted to really tackle the, the, the growing problem of child and youth mental health concerns that, that are in this province. We start by saying, what can we do to create conditions that actually create mental health and wellness, that create physical health and wellness, that create a sense of connection, that tell a child a story that not only do you belong, but you are valued. You are cared for. We put resources into your well-being. We want to make sure that every child in this province has everything they need to thrive every day that they go to school. That this is, this is a guaranteed place of abundance for children. And it's a guaranteed place of abundance without the ubiquitous virtual world always there. That it's a place of abundance where kids are playing outdoors, that kids are interacting with each other, that kids are freed of that time uh, that their phones take away from them. And they're freed of that constant input, that constant stimulation that comes with uh, these phones always grabbing our attention, always grabbing and directing our emotions. And I think that we should take this moment and this time we're in very seriously. We have the evidence now. We have the experts telling us what's needed to be done. And we have the choice, always, about how we spend resources, how we invest, what we invest in, and if we recognize with legislation like this that there are real harms happening to children right now as a result of the way that companies are operating, let's do something right now to decrease those harms and to make sure that kids are spending their day in a place and an environment that is improving their health and well-being as opposed to contributing to the harms that they're experiencing. Thank you.